This is Canada. You can find about, well, 10 species of dangerous animals here. Not much, right? And this is the Amazon Basin. It's smaller than Canada, and in the animal kingdom, it's kind of like a prison, where all the most dangerous criminals are held. The Amazon has been creating murderers and monsters for over 60 million years. And here is proof of how dangerous the world once was. What are those, vertebrae? They don't look very threatening, but only because you don't know who they belong to. Whoa, an anaconda is capable of swallowing a whole alligator, a cow, or a human being. Now imagine what a monster that is much bigger can do. A few million years after that meteorite hit the Earth, the Titanoboa, the largest snake ever found, appeared in what is now Colombia. Titanoboas could grow up to 41.9 feet in length and reach a weight of 2,502 pounds. This giant snake was five times bigger than the largest alive today. Living in the rainforest, these snakes had every right to choose any menu they wanted. Ancient turtles? Why not? Ancestors of crocodiles? Give them some. However, despite their size, the Titanoboa seem to have eaten fish. I can't even roughly estimate how many fish such a giant needed to feed on. That's a lot of fish. It's believed that the Titanoboa was able to reach its frightening size because of the warmer climate that existed on the planet at the time. But perhaps the giant was so big that it needed some coolness to keep itself from overheating. Maybe that's why the giant snakes went extinct. They just got too hot. However, although Titanoboas are gone, there's still plenty of creatures in the Amazon basin today that you'd better never approach. Oh, damn it. Cap. No. Oh, man. You don't have to take your pants off. Yeah. Oh, gotta get them off my legs here. One out of every 10 species known to science lives in these rainforests. It's home to the largest collection of plants and animal species on our planet. Absolutely insane numbers. Millions of species of insects, thousands of birds and fish, hundreds of mammals, amphibians and reptiles, and too many here can be deadly to humans. There are about 100 species of poisonous frogs in the Amazon forest alone, some of which can kill you with a single touch. And then there are crocodiles, electric eels, piranhas, venomous snakes, vampire bats, big wild cats. You can also find armed spiders here. Bites from these spiders are always very serious and can result in horrifying injuries to people. In the Guinness Book of World Records 2010, this genus was recognized as the most venomous among the spider species. Yes, it's since lost its title, but it's unlikely to calm anyone. And bullet ants? And giant scolopendras? And don't forget the anaconda, heir to the titanoboa? Even sharks swim in the Amazon! My God, what is wrong with this place? Because this is the bad place. It begins to seem that almost every creature in these woods is in the mood to kill. But it's an illusion. It's all because of the diversity of species. The more of them there are, the higher the percentage of those who pose a danger. Quite logical. And it's all the fault of the climate. Tropics are suitable for comfortable living all year round. It's warm and humid enough for plants to flourish and give food to herbivores. And they, in turn, increase the population of predators. By the way, the number of venomous creatures is also related to warmth. There are only four species of venomous snakes living in Canada, which I've already mentioned. They just don't like the cold and getting not enough food. The snake came from there. I've never seen, ever, a snake track in the winter. Let me show you how it works. Speaking of Titanoboa, it's a good time to bring up another prehistoric monster that's on everybody's radar. The Megalodon lived much later, but lived in most parts of the world's oceans. However, the monster didn't like the cold and like the abundance of food. Who, anyway, can blame it for that? There's no point in living where you can starve to death, especially when you're a giant shark. If you look at a map, it's clear that the Megalodon had favorite regions. Apparently, there was enough food and the climate was nicer. But when it comes to events that occurred several tens of millions of years ago, the question arises, why did the scientists even assume that everything happened that way? One can assume anything. However, the theories are supported by findings, and it's difficult to argue with such evidence. Even if the tooth of a megalodon is suddenly found in the middle of the desert. Wait, what? Oh my oh. god! Look at the size of this thing! You're not saying that a giant shark just put itself ashore, crawled for hundreds of miles, and then died, leaving behind only a couple of teeth? The whole point is that the world is changing. The world is changed. I feel it in the water. 
No, no, that's not what I meant. Since the formation of our planet, the continents have come together and gone apart so many times that we can make a separate video about it. Where there's only a pile of sand and rock today, there used to be seas. For example, 270 million years ago, Arizona was home to a population of sharks. So the megalodon teeth found in the Baja California desert aren't the most surprising thing yet. So far, our ideas about what the ancient Earth looked like are the result of soil studies and animal remains, plus some speculation. A lot of fish bones and teeth in some place, so there was water there, even if no one had heard of it before. Doesn't matter. Any find can be a discovery or a fabrication. In 1869, two American laborers hired by a man named George Hole to dig a well discovered a 10-foot-tall fossilized man in the ground. The find was so shocking to ordinary people that they were willing to pay just to look at the ancient giant. Scientists said many times that it was just a fake, but that didn't stop George Hole from selling the remains. He got about $460,000 in today's dollars for the find and then admitted that the man was made of plaster. He aged the sculpture with stains and acids, created pores in the skin with knitting needles, and then buried the giant. The preparation for the hoax cost George Hole a modern $50,000, a very profitable investment in people's desire to believe anything. I don't believe it. That's the skull of Goliath. It may seem that people were so easily fooled, but let's be honest. Some people love the unexplained, the mysterious, and the frightening. When they find a dead cow, they won't think it was killed by some predator or a man. No, it's better to find a mystical trace in such stories and blame it on aliens. I know exactly who did it. Now we gotta go prove it. But that's what our brains are. Throughout history, people have invented monsters in order to understand the way the world works. Science helps now, but what about hundreds or even thousands of years ago? The Scythians, who discovered the skeletons of Protoceratops, invented griffins because they could find no other explanation for creatures with beaks and huge blades. The Japanese believe that earthquakes were caused by the giant Namazu catfish. It lives in the mud beneath the Japanese islands and sometimes twitches, causing the earth to shake violently. And that sounds logical enough. If you don't know anything about the movement of the lithospheric plates, a huge nervous catfish looks pretty realistic. The more educated people are, the more likely it is that they won't believe the stories about some shapeshifter pig, but they're more likely to be seriously frightened by a story about an elusive, violent criminal. Because you know, criminals are more real. Also, legends depend a lot on their region. If you live in New York City, stories about crocodiles in the sewers are very familiar to you. But what is there to be afraid of for people who live in the Amazon jungle, for example? Crocodiles are common to them, unlike the complex system of sewage pipes, so the locals scare their children with other fiction, such as about a wild, cruel tribe that no one's ever seen. But is it fiction, really? In the Amazon rainforest, there are about 50 isolated tribes, communities that have no contact with other communities or the outside world. They're in voluntary isolation, often very aggressive toward outsiders and unwilling to change anything. In 2020, Rieli Franciascato, a wilderness researcher, was killed by an arrow fired by one of the natives. These semi-mythical people didn't know, and may never know, that Rieli was one of their main defenders in all of Brazil. But let's not get sad. Let's go from the rainforest to Scotland home to one of the most famous fictional monsters. Welcome to Loch Ness. The famous Nessie has been called many things, an eel, a giant catfish, even a plesiosaur who lived. But another version has recently emerged, a whale. Or rather a whale fragment using which, well, you can carry on the line. <clears throat> this idea was suggested by James Felton, and if you want more information, Google it. YouTube doesn't really like that kind of intimate details. Well, if you find it strange that the legends of the Loch Ness Monster are still told today, in spite of all the scientific advances, it's simple. Nessie's a real treasure trove for tourism. Those wishing to see the creature come to the lake every year. Once you've seen it, you'll believe there's something there. Definitely. Such big mystifications sooner or later turn into money. And they're not forgeries of archaeological finds, which can cost a fortune. I'm not kidding. Crooks could very well make a couple of million dollars on an allegedly ancient statue. Not to mention how much dinosaur bones are valued at. Yes, not only museums, but also private collectors buy them. A $3 million stegosaurus skeleton? How about that? And a couple of smaller lizards for $2.9 million? 
probably on sale, right? An Allosaurus for $1.4 million. These are all real numbers, and just imagine how much fraudsters can make on such fakes. Especially since people are willing to believe anything. Shut up and take my money! Okay, okay, people just love to believe the unbelievable. This, by the way, is what the creators of viral videos, which often turn out to be promotional videos, do. You know, it's been, uh, it's been... <gasps> Surely you must have seen Evan Longoria catch a ball with his bare hand during an interview. To date, the video has over 10 million views, and few have noticed that there are the Gillette logos to the left and right of the athlete's head. Yes, it's just a commercial. But the video about the snowboarder and the bear, which by the way has 14 million views, was created for those very views. If you think about it, how is it different from that plaster statue of the giant? We'll see you later.